Uh, so we've got a couple things that are coming out to the tables that you will have a chance to see real soon. Um, but I'm here to talk about how we might play with our work. So how do we play with our work as facilitators? And so, yes, uh, as Douglas mentioned, I am a toy designer. That's kind of how I started post-college. I came up with a toy um, that I created uh, in my mechanical engineering and product design courses, but found also a love for facilitation and teaching entrepreneurship to students and worked at university for a while doing that and have found this intersection of play and facilitation and learning experience design to be kind of the spot where there's so much opportunity, I think, for us as facilitators to play a little bit more with our work. Um, but I have to start off by just saying, I'm so excited to be here and be in person. I keep making the joke a million times, like, oh, you can see my legs and my body, and I don't exactly know what to do with my hands. Um, but it's so important for us to celebrate the things that we haven't had a chance to celebrate with each other in the last couple of years. So paper is coming around, and you've got some little things on uh, that you've just gotten handed to, but um, grab some paper. Um, and what I want everyone to do is take out a piece of paper, and for people who are joining virtually too, uh, hang out in, in Mural and make a post-it of this. Um, but add your name, and then what's something that deserves celebration? So what's something that you want to celebrate, whether it's personal or professional or something that happened or is exciting or that needs a round of applause um, that you didn't get a chance to celebrate in the last couple of years? For me, on mine, you can see Shannon Varco. I'm speaking at the Control the Room Summit uh, today in Austin. So that's something I'm absolutely celebrating today. So grab that piece of paper. Definitely make sure you write your name at the top. And then write down something that you want to celebrate. I'll give everyone a couple seconds to do that. And like I said, for those of you who I can see it happening over there, which is so cool. Um, so yeah, write down on there so that we can celebrate each other virtually as well. All right, everyone had a chance to do that? Great. So what we're going to do next is a 30-second celebration. So what you've got here are these neat little uh, streamers, actually. So when you are done writing your celebration, I'll give a quick little demo of this. Um, grab, hopefully everyone has one. If you don't, I don't know if there's a couple extras. But go ahead and grab it. And what you're going to do is you're actually going to rip off the paper, this like tissue paper on top. And then we're all going to stand up. So as you do that, it's definitely better if you stand up. Everyone's got them over there too? OK, good. So stand up. Be careful. They might fall out a little bit with it. Everybody's got one? OK. Put my clicker and get back here. OK. And then you just rip off the paper. Everyone did that. So flip it over. You kind of put it around your finger. So you're going to want this. Yeah, I should explain this a little better here. I've never done this before. I just got these, and we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> so put it around your finger. So you want, to, you want to hold it. You don't want to actually throw it. It's going to stay onto your finger. But what you're going to do is actually throw. Should I do it first? I want to do it all together. But I'll do one first, then I have another one. So what you're going to do is you're going to keep it looped on your finger and then throw up, and it's going to do that, OK? But you want to keep it on your hand. Yeah, so ready? OK, on the count of three. We're all going to do it together, OK? We got some already. It's all right. It's all right. Ready? Three, two, one, oh, go. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I love it. It's fantastic. OK. And so as you're doing that, think about the thing. Yes, it's on the ceiling. It's so great. Um, like I said, just trying this out for the first time. We're going to see how it goes. And We'll pull these back together. So what's great about them is that you can actually just kind of pull it back to you, wrap it up, and then you can kind of keep the celebration going on your table. Awesome. Thank you all for doing that and celebrating all the things that we need to celebrate together. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Cool. And that's it. I'm good. Thanks. Sorry. Right. Yeah, no, just kidding. Um, so why is it so important to play with your work as everyone's finishing this up? And you can have a seat whenever you're ready. Um, but I want everyone to think as we talk through this, how might you play with your definition of play? So what even is play? A lot of times we think about toys or games or little kids playing. But as facilitators, how can we really think about what play is? So what comes to mind for some folks as you, you know, ask the question, what is play? What comes to mind? I know, obviously, the things I just said, kids. What else? Other thoughts? Fun, yes. Uh, what else? Other things? Building. Building.
building stuff. Great one. Uh, so the toy I created is actually a building toy. So building stuff is definitely uh, a big part of play in my life. Uh, so what is play kind of, there's so many different definitions of it, but one I've shared here is um, it's an activity that we engage in just for its own sake, because we enjoy it, because it's fun and it brings us joy. A lot of times play can be really purposeful too, and there are so many benefits of play as well. So it releases endorphins, boosts creativity, increases laughter, brings some color to our lives, um, and there's so many other benefits of play that I, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend Googling, there's a million articles about it. But how might we actually design more play into our work as facilitators? And so what can we do to create more opportunities for play in different ways? And so what I also want you to do is grab that piece of paper that you started with your celebration on, flip it over, or grab a new piece, whichever. And I want you to think about in your own work, what's a way that you might incorporate more play into whatever it is that you're building and creating? So what are you designing? Is there a workshop? Is there a meeting, what topic or subject matter is it about, um, and who is it for, who's the audience. And we're gonna think about designing for your own work um, and designing play into your own work today a little bit. And for those online too, uh, go ahead and, and drop that in another post-it, maybe like on the second half or something um, of that, because we're gonna be brainstorming a little bit together on how we might incorporate more play. So once you do that, what are you designing? What topic or subject matter is it about, and who's the audience? Go ahead and write that down. And again, make sure your name is on this because we're gonna be moving these around a little bit. Because what I want you to do next, once you have that piece of paper ready to go, and I'll come back to this slide, but for those who've kind of moved forward and have your design, topic, audience figured out, um, you're gonna go ahead and turn this paper into a paper airplane. So there's no specific way of doing it. You can kind of figure out your own way of doing it. Um, but once you're done with that, go ahead and fold it into a paper airplane. I'll put it back on the screen for a second so you have a chance to do that. So as you're working on that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about designing for play. So how do we actually create ideas for activities and ways that we can play with each other? And it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how, which is a great Dr. Seuss quote that I love um, for thinking about how we actually design for this stuff. And so we're gonna talk now about playing with play patterns. So what are patterns of play? What are ways that are the kind of building blocks of what, what makes play happen? And so as you're kind of finishing those up, yep. Um, great, we've got seven that I'm gonna walk through today that are all from the National Institute of Play. So these are seven main play patterns that you'll see in play from kids to animals to adults, um, but there's many different ways that we can play and we're gonna dig into seven of them but it looks like we've got some paper airplanes going. So once you have your paper airplane ready to go, go ahead and just give it a toss. See how far you can get it across the room and just give it a throw. Excellent. Toss them, toss them. <laughs> Wonderful, yes, that's great. They're going well. And then once you do it, go ahead and find someone else's plane. So if, it's, if it didn't make it too far and it's at your table, just grab one that isn't yours. Ooh, that one went far, woo! Couldn't have planned that if we tried. Awesome. All right, I'll pass this one back. Oop, I did terrible, I'm sorry. Um, and grab a plane that's not yours and open it up. And what you're gonna do is help this other person that you may or may not know uh, have some ideas about how they might incorporate play into the work that they shared on this piece of paper. So go ahead, open them up when you find a new one. And what I want you to think about as you look at that person's kind of play opportunity um, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk through the first three play patterns, and as we learn about these, um, <laughs> it was like a boomerang, came back on you. Um, so again, grab one that, you, that isn't yours, um, so hopefully everyone's got a new piece of paper. Open it up, take a read, and then I want you to think about, as I go through the first three play patterns here, how those play patterns might be an opportunity for play in the description that was given to you to brainstorm about. All right, so we're gonna start with attunement play. So attunement play is kind of the very, very basic building block of play. A lot of times we think of this as, you know, a parent and a baby playing peekaboo, making eye contact, kind of having that first, oh, I see you, I'm, I'm understanding what's going on here, I'm mimicking, I'm mirroring. Matthew actually did an amazing job at the very beginning today doing some attunement play as we were walking around and sharing and connecting with one another. So attunement is really that attention, observation, connection, and it's really that very, very basis of where play comes from. So attunement play. 
And think about how maybe connection can happen through standing up and moving around, but also that eye contact, that connection with another person is attunement play. Body and movement play. So this is something that you know, we often see with, even as we did this morning too, standing up, moving around, really changes the energy in the room. Throwing streamers, throwing a plane, that kind of using your body and using movement. A lot of times you'll also see in improv, there's kind of movement or play. Um, you think of recess, kids running around. There's something to getting your body moving, standing up, moving around, moving your arms. Um, I don't know if anyone's done like the shake out thing. I sometimes will start to do that before I come up here um, to increase or decrease your heart rate depending on the movement that you're doing. So what ways maybe for this piece of paper in front of you could body or movement play be used to incorporate play into some of your facilitation? This can also be really great, we found for virtual too, because people are sitting at their desk for effort. I know I do it all the time. And it's you know, just that opportunity to stand up, stretch, stretch the edges of your, you know, your screen. And maybe people who are online can do that right now too. Um, but how can physical activity, energy transfer, uh, change the room through body and movement play? Awesome. Storytelling and narrative play. So of course, storytelling is a huge part of our work as facilitators. Again, Matthew did an amazing job with so many stories um, that really you know, provided an opportunity for us to actively listen. But how can we use storytelling or narrative to think of activities that are playful um, as we're you know, putting people together to share stories with one another? So it's storytelling, but also thinking about, I have on here, active listening. So it's storytelling, but it's also story listening. And how can story listening and storytelling become a playful activity that you might incorporate into some of your work? All right, now that you've done that, go ahead and give that piece of paper that you're just working on, maybe sharing some ideas on. Um, as you've, if you've shared any ideas or written any down on there, go ahead and put your name on it so that if you, these are gonna get back to their rightful owners eventually, but go ahead and put your name on it with the ideas that you might have shared, um, any contact information, and we will get those back to them. If you didn't put any ideas down, it's okay too. Um, no worries. But if you'd like, give it another fold, give it another toss, and we'll start to brainstorm on a couple more pieces of paper. But I'm gonna keep on going. So if, it doesn't, if we don't get to that part and give it another throw, it's okay. All right, we're gonna jump to the next four. So we've got object play. Somebody said in the back, building things. Uh, so playing with physical things, throwing a paper airplane, uh, using your hands and using your brain together is a great opportunity for play. A lot of times this also gives us an opportunity to build a thing with other people and see how that might be a, a way that we're learning about teamwork or collaboration. Um, but in, and it's also an opportunity too as you're building, think of um, you know, building a set of blocks and it falling down and you know, needing strength on a certain side or kind of how you might balance things. It's all problem solving, testing, finding solutions as we build things. And these might seem pretty obvious, but I think that's kind of some of the best parts that I love about play, is that it's usually pretty simple concepts, but it's about how we might apply these to the work that we're doing. So how might you build object play into an activity that you've done, or even into an icebreaker or something like that? All right, imaginative and pretend play. So somewhat similar in ways to storytelling, we can come up with creative stories. But imaginative and pretend play, especially as I've learned with facilitating with adults, is a great opportunity to get people to try on new beliefs, have no judgment, no rules. This really works well in brainstorming, as we're trying to think of things that might not exist, is really imaginative and pretend play. So when you think of somebody as a, a kid thinking about, you know, tell me a story of this crazy story about whatever thing, it's also, you know, hey, person brainstorming, tell me this crazy story of how this might work or how this might be used on the moon or used on Mars and how we can Im imagine and use pretend play to get us to think outside the box often we'll hear. And then social play. So social play is all about playing with others. So how well do we play with others um, when we're collaborating or working together, whether it's building something or creating a, a, a project or whatever it might be with our teams? How can we also use play that's collaborative um, or play that social and relationship building. And then I also find that social play turns into competitive play, which I'm a very competitive person, um, and how that can also be used as a facilitator to you know, provide different opportunities for playfulness. Turn taking, sharing, these are all things that we learn as, with social play as kids. But we're doing the same thing and learning about them with new people that we're playing with, even as adults. And then the last one that we'll cover today is creative play. So, so much play can you know, connect and stack with each other. So we'll see you know, attunement play matched with body and movement play. 
But creative play is all about expression. So this is your painting something, making a song, um, really thinking about how, how this is a creative outlet for play. Um, even you know, taking something like this and creating a piece of art with it or whatever it might be, but how can you be creative in different ways um, with whatever it might be that you're doing? It also provides an opportunity for expression and connection to self. So what I love about creative play is that sometimes it can be an individual playful activity for people who maybe social play is a bit much or uh, you know, doing things that they want to kind of express their own self through a piece of artwork um, or through a song or music. Awesome. So that was a very quick kind of blast through all seven. But again, like I said, what's great about these is they're seemingly obvious, but it's sort of nice to have a pattern, I find, to be able to think, okay, what's an activity I want to do? And I kind of am, you know, maybe stuck with the same icebreakers or the same ways that I've gone about playing. But I start to think about, okay, how could I do that activity, but let's kind of stack on body and movement play, or let's stack on creative play, or let's stack on imaginative and pretend play, and how might I have people play in some of those ways? And it helps me to think outside the box a little bit of how I even design for play. All right, so give it a final fold. If you moved it before, if you didn't, go ahead, give it a final fold. Finish it up. Hopefully you've gotten pretty good at making these by now. <laughs> Not really, that's okay too. <laughs> um, it's a good... I love the paper airplanes because it's great for... It's a great activity actually for prototyping and iterating on your design. So if you have people kind of make a paper airplane three, four times, you can really learn about iteration in prototyping. But in summary, so we talked about today the definition of play. How do you play with your definition of play? And I think fun and lighthearted and levity is always great in kind of times like this, but it's also play doesn't have to always be silly. You don't have to come up and you know be the clown on stage as the facilitator or wear the crazy earrings or have the crazy hair um, or the red nose, which you can't see under here. It's under there, just kidding. Um, but it's not always about kind of being the, the silly facilitator at the beginning, but it's about creating an, um, really impressive, wonderful, fun activities that incorporate play as your facilitator. And then how do you design your play with your design of play? So thinking differently about what types of play you might be able to do um, and incorporating those different play patterns. All right, so go ahead and give a toss to the screens up here. So these are your targets now, and I'm going to get these papers back to everybody. So try your best to get your plane to the target, and we'll collect them over there and get them back to their rightful owners. <laughs> we'll give them a try. <laughs> and so as you're thinking through your next facilitations or your next activities that you're designing, think about how you might build the patterns of play together into building blocks for the next creative activities that you might do. Awesome. Thank you so much.